first of all, welcome to this uh, seminar. And uh, we are very honored to have uh, Professor Peng Wei from Iowa State, Aeroastro, here uh, this morning to talk about uh, his uh, exciting research on UAVs. So uh, Peng got his uh, uh, bachelor's in automation from Tsinghua and uh, his master's in electrical engineering from uh, Stony Brook. Right. PhD in, uh, in, in aerospace yeah. from Purdue, West Lafayette. And uh, he was a lab mate uh, of mine when we were both at uh, Lafayette. Right. And uh, he joined uh, the faculty of uh, Iowa State Aero Astro in 2015, uh, one year after he got his PhD, right? I spent uh, one and a half years in uh, American Airlines. Oh yes, right. As a in the industry, uh, as an operation research researcher. analyst. Yeah. Yes, right. So <clears throat> today he's going to talk about his uh, his research on uh, on uh, UAVs for uh, for personal uh, utilization, and uh, we are very excited to have you here. And uh, let's uh, let's welcome Punk. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, for coming to my talk. Uh, thanks for uh, Professor Jin and NYU C2 Smart hosting me. Um, so today I'll talk about uh, my talk title is Unlock the Personal Sky, Safe and Assured Autonomy for On-Demand Urban Air Mobility. Uh, so since about two years ago, uh, this term called urban air mobility or on-demand urban air mobility became uh, a trend in air transportation field, because my field is air transportation. The idea here is to use uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing, so which means uh, the, the air aircraft is electric powered. Uh, when it take off and landing, it, it can act like a helicopter. But when it's uh, flying en route, it's acting like a fixed wing aircraft. To use this type of vehicle to transport people and cargo within urban setting. Uh, so, so this uh, is potentially can provide another transportation mode uh, which can alleviate the, the, the ground uh, transportation traffic jam. Um, so a lot of companies are, are working on this new type of vehicle, aircraft. Uh, so some companies are still in the design stage, some companies are in the testing stage already. Uh, but my research is uh, not on the design and manufacturing side, not on the vehicle design side, but rather in the transportation operation side. Okay. Um, my so some people may think it's kind of crazy. So basically, which means uh, in future we have this um, um, Uber type of operation uh, for cars, so urban uh, aerial ride sharing. Uh, so, but you know when. Ford, um, you know, said he wants to make every family has a car, and people think he's crazy because that time uh, manufacturing a car is very expensive. And Bill Gates also, his dream was to give everyone a computer, and people thought he was crazy. But so again, so this uh, personal aircraft, or at least personal on-demand aero sharing, uh, may sound crazy, but personally, this is my passion, and this is my current research interest. Okay. All right, so a little bit about my group. Uh, my group uh, official name is called Intelligent Aerospace Systems Lab, IASL. Uh, so our group develop uh, models, algorithms for uh, design and operation of air transportation and aviation systems. So the methodology our group use are um, control, optimization, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Um, so our traditionally focus is on control and optimization. So uh, currently, we are more on uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence side. So application-wise, uh, my traditionally in the past, I've been working on uh, air traffic control, air traffic management. Those are the FAA and NASA projects. And then uh, in my first job, I worked at airline operations. So basically working with airline dispatchers or fleet management, uh, how to make sure you know, the flights are on time, or at least when they cancel, they do not cause a lot of damage um, to the passengers and also to the airline themselves. 
and then my uh, new applications are as follows. So here is uh, UAS traffic management. So when we talk about UAS traffic management, we are talking about smaller drones. So smaller guys like DJI or, so, or, or drones under 50 pounds where people use that to deliver lighter package, to use that for uh, phot photography or filming purpose. So that's uh, UAS traffic management. Um, and then electric vehicle prognostics. Uh, so our work was on uh, battery modeling and battery uh, you know, remaining life prediction. Uh, and then this is uh, what we are going to cover today. This is uh, eVTOL or electric vertical takeoff and landing urban air mobility. Again, this is uh, Airbus um, uh, vision. So uh, they are building this type of aircraft called Vahana. Uh, so they are trying to use this type of vehicle uh, to transport cargo and, and, and people uh, within cities. Uh, the last part is kind of different with the first five. Uh, so my group is also working on autonomous drone racing. Uh, so some people say, oh, the first five is all about make air transportation or flying safer. But suddenly we have this autonomous drone racing kind of counter uh, you know, a purpose with the first five. The reason we want to study here is because we want to study where, you know, in the high speed flying, where the limitation uh, in terms of both, both hardware and, uh, and software, where are the limitations for the safety and efficiency uh, for uh, flying safety or aviation safety. All right, so that's my lab. Uh, so here we talk about, you know, the urban air mobility, which is this. We'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, so the idea of urban air mobility or UAM, uh, the core ideas are as follows. Uh, number one, uh, people want to use vertical takeoff and landing aircraft to transport uh, people and, and, and cargo. So vertical takeoff and landing means, you know, it, when it, it's in takeoff and landing stage, it acts like a helicopter. Uh, number the second one, electric propulsion. So the vehicle should be electric aircraft instead of uh, you know, gas powered. And then number three, uh, we want the vehicle to, be, uh, to have the, a short or certifiable autonomy. Uh, so because the FAA, you know, if we want to use this vehicle to flying over people's head and also to use this type of vehicle to transport human, you know, FAA have a suite of, uh, you know, certification process to go through uh, in terms of the avionics and also the vehicle itself. Uh, the later two are not that, you know, core ideas, but people are still kind of in discussion. So number one is how this type of vehicle should be operated. So should, should it operate it on demand, which more like uh, Uber type of operation or taxi type of operation, or by schedule? Uh, type of like a, like a bus or transit type of operation. So this is still in discussion, but in Uber's uh, you know, vision, so they want to uh, utilize this vehicle to do this on-demand uh, type of operation. Uh, so number two is this operation should be a, a, a ride sharing, uh, which means the company owns the vehicle uh, or, or the driver themselves own the vehicle, uh, but not the riders or it can be personal owned. Uh, so maybe a family or, or a person actually own the vehicle uh, by, by themselves or by itself. So that's the core ideas. And the goal here is, uh, you know, we want to build urban air mobility uh, uh, to be a safe, efficient, and affordable transportation mode uh, in an urban setting. Uh, the challenges here are multiple. I'm just listing a few of them. Uh, number one, the vehicle design and manufacturing. So in the vehicle design and manufacturing, the major challenges here are the battery capacity or the battery technology. So basically, if we want the vehicle to fly longer in terms of time or distance, the current battery technology, it means we need larger batteries. So larger battery means the aircraft will become heavier. So it, it actually limited the range and time the aircraft can fly. So uh, vehicle design manufacturing have a lot of challenge. Battery is number one. Number two is the noise. Uh, so 
actually without this urban air mobility operation, uh, you know, we already see some helicopter operation in, in some cities, but not many. Uh, why? Because helicopters, especially those big rotors, powerful rotors, will make a lot of noises and it will impact people's daily life. So in New York, in Tokyo, we actually have some helipads on some uh, high-rise buildings, but we don't see helicopters operation that much. You know, we see some helicopter operations in the tour of uh, a Statue of Liberty, and maybe we see some uh, you know, hospital or, or uh, emergency or medical type of helicopter operation, but we don't see them much. That's because of noise. So, so battery and noise are the two major challenges here. And we have uh, infrastructures. So although the smaller drones can take off and land pretty much almost everywhere, like I live in a suburb, so it can take off and land in my driveway, in my backyard, it can take off and land in the high-rise buildings, uh, top of the roof, uh, but for this type of vehicle, the larger one, so we, we need a uh, larger space uh, for takeoff take and landing. So we're talking about you know, a large uh, rooftop of a parking uh, structure or you know, a large area on top, of, uh, on top of the building. So we need designated um, uh, infrastructures. Uh, we usually call it vertiports uh, to land those vehicles. And the third challenge is the policy. So, so FAA have certification regulation and policy on vehicle itself and also on the operation side. So how do we make sure it's safe? How do we make sure, you know, you know FAA is, is a very cautious um, agency. So, you know, we don't want aircraft to crash, uh, you know, because not only the passenger on board uh, will be, um, uh, will have danger, but also uh, people on ground uh, will, will, uh, um, will be impacted. And then the last challenge is operations. So how do we make sure from operation side, uh, how do we make sure this type of operation is safe and also efficiency? So uh, my group uh, is majorly focused on operation side of uh, urban air mobility. Uh, so this um, uh, blueprint from published by Airbus, so it's my group uh, and uh, my colleagues at MIT, so Professor Hamsa Balakrishnan and a group from uh, Stanford, Michael Kokenderfer. So, so these three academic teams and with some uh, industrial partners uh, co collaborated and, and published this uh, last year. Okay, so we talk about my group, IASL, and we talk about you know, uh, the term UAM or urban air mobility. So what type of UAM research in my group uh, are going on. So in general, we have uh, five different categories. Uh, so how do we uh, make sure UAM operations are safe? Uh, so we'll start from the leftmost here. Uh, so we envision that in near term, the airspace will become, the first airspace will become congested, will be at this, uh, arrival phase or departure phase. We talk about those vehicles must land and take off in a specific um, spot, we call it vertiports. So we, we imagine in those vertiports or close, close by those vertiports, those airspace will become uh, congested first or busy first. So we need some management uh, on this um, uh, airspace. So here we talk about single aircraft energy efficiency trajectory optimization. You know, for a single aircraft, how do we design an optimal descending trajectory? And then how do we closely monitor and predict the remaining battery uh, life? It's also important because those vehicles are heavily limited by their battery life. When it comes to the landing spot, almost they will burn out their battery. So we need to closely monitor the battery uh, also. And then other than this two single aircraft um, you know, research topics, you know, when we have multiple aircraft are trying to land at the same time, how do we schedule them? How do we do the arrival scheduling? That's another um, topic. Uh, and then this is uh, some research, um, uh, this is some plots um, we have for one type of vehicle flying different 
uh, descending trajectory and associated time and also associated um, uh, energy consumed for different type of uh, trajectory. Uh, you know, our fin fun finding is the steeper we fly, the faster we will land, but the shallower we, we fly, the, uh, the less energy we will uh, consume. So uh, at the bottom, we have our publication listed, and the trophy here is the uh, best paper award. So second one, uh, so when we kind of, you know, suppose or assume we can handle this arrival management uh, well, and we imagine our next challenge with this uh, traffic continue to grow, we imagine our challenge will happen in en route airspace. En route basically means uh, level flight. So suppose we successfully handle this takeoff and landing. En route means, you know, we fly at the same altitude level, and how do we make sure we avoid collisions, and how do we, so this is vehicle to vehicle collision avoidance. This is a centralized control, we call it autonomous uh, air traffic control, or autonomous ATC. So this is ground-based centralized. This is vehicle to vehicle. So how do we utilize this tool to make sure uh, there is no uh, collision uh, happen? So first, uh, collision avoidance. Um, so in this study, uh, in, in the you know, concept of operation, we imagine a free flight operation, which means in the sky, we do not uh, construct it, or we do not limit the aircraft, must follow certain route or follow certain waypoints. So we just let the aircraft do free flight, which means it can utilize uh, every airspace volume it wants. So this is called free flight. Uh, just like pedestrians wa walking uh, open uh, space, uh, just in, uh, like in uh, Times Square or in uh, uh, airport uh, terminal, so free flight operation. And so here the problem is how do we develop this computational guidance algorithm? So guidance in aerospace term is basically telling a, a vehicle how to move from point A to point B, so guidance. And at the same time, we need to make sure we have this collision avoidance capability. Uh, so collision avoidance basically means do not crash into other vehicles. In this case, we have sort of crowded airspace. Uh, we have this uh, square map, 24 kilometers by 24 kilometers. We have all the red aircraft uh, we call other aircraft, or we call intruders. At the same time, we want to control this yellow aircraft to fly to its destination, which is Green Star, without crashing into the red aircraft. Uh, so this is uh, uh, research right here. Uh, so we have two publications listed here. The third bullet here is, uh, is a centralized ground-based control, uh, autonomous uh, ATC. So here is free flight, which means we do not have highways or structures in the airspace. But here our concept is, you know, if we, we still follow the traditional commercial aviation, we still have highways and those waypoints in the sky, or which, which means we have a structured airspace. You know, how do we make sure uh, we do this autonomous separation assurance and our uh, algorithm is uh, hierarchical deep reinforcement learning to solve this problem. Uh, this is uh, you know, a simulator uh, you know, granted by NASA. So our algorithm is basically playing this simulator, uh, make sure the vehicles arrive the destination uh, on time and without collision. So we also have uh, two publications here and one best paper award. So next part is, okay, assume I kind of have very good tools, very successful tools can handle arrival and departure and also en route, uh, no matter it's free flight or structured airspace, no matter it's, you know, air to air or so, or so called multi-agent approach or the centralized approach or it's combined. Maybe I can have one agent sit on the ground and multiple agent in the air. Maybe I can have structure space or free, uh, free flight, or maybe I can have both. So this part is still you know, in, in, you know, in, in progress, but assume if we have some good tools to handle those three, 
those three actually represent a suite of very high efficient, very high efficient decision support tools to make sure the safe and, and efficient tactical operations. So tactical operations means if aircraft want to take off, let them take off, and we will handle them in the en route, and we will handle them in the terminal air, airspace. However, if those three, you know, already in their maximum performance, but still there's, there's many, many aircraft trying to take off, so should, the, should we allow them to take off? We already know these three define uh, airspace maximum throughput or airspace maximum capacity, whatever we call. We, we already know the maximum capacity in en route or in terminal. You know, if all the aircraft still want to take off, should we let them take off? You know, in, in ground transportation, maybe yes, because we cannot limit people. When I want to get off work and drive home, the centralized agency can now tell me, no, you know, wait on your parking lot for 15 minutes. I, we cannot do this. Because, you know, I can afford to, to go on the highway and sit on the highway, you know, because I won't crash and my, my fuel, usually I have plenty of fuel, I, I will not run off the gas. But in electric aircraft uh, we are dealing with, if we let those guys take off, at the same time hovering or wait in the sky in somewhere, you know, maybe they will burn out their battery and maybe they will fall off the sky, so which, which is very dangerous. So here we, um, we use the traditional uh, commercial uh, air transportation technique. We call it airspace management. Uh, so basically each aircraft will submit their pre-departure flight plan, uh, which means before I start fly or start drive, I submit my plan, my route to a centralized agency. I can submit multiple routes with options. And then we are dealing with a demand and capacity imbalance uh, because in some airspace, we have limited capacity, especially in the vertiport uh, or in the, some core waypoints in the sky. We have some limited um, uh, capacity. At the same time, if we submit those flight plan, we have a, some estimation of the demand. So how do we handle demand and capacity imbalance? How do we do strategical traffic flow management, which means we want to make the aircraft wait before they take off. So, so wait there on the ground for, for one hour, for 30 minutes, instead of take off and wait in the air, because waiting in the air is dangerous. Okay, and all those four we talk about are about you know, the FAA side, or, or kind of game host side of uh, problem. Uh, but here, inside a fleet, uh, so for example, if Uber want to operate this type of urban air mobility operation, so inside a fleet, they are organizing a mini airline. So, so should they do on demand or by schedule for this operation? So should they have their demand modeling to estimate the daily uh, demand uh, from one vertiport to the other? Uh, if they have a good uh, demand modeling, maybe they can do part of the operation by schedule to capture the major demand. And then they use some on-demand operation to capture the remaining. So how do they do their network scheduling? And how do they do their uh, real-time dispatch? Uh, so those uh, are the other work on fleet dispatch. So those are the UT, uh, UAM research in my group. And today, we'll focus on this part. So collision avoidance and computational guidance. So now I may go to the computer to click. Let's see, it's not moving, so I'll go here and click. All right, so this is a envision of free flight operations in uh, UAM. Uh, so everything is in 2D instead of 3D because we talk about this guy. Uh, we only want to handle the en route operation. At the same time, we can observe there's no highway or no uh, waypoints in the sky, so everyone just uh, you know, flying point to point. And every aircraft is spawned uh, from a randomized location and to a, to a random uh, destination. And we can observe there's actually a lot of uh, you know, collisions between them. Right? So we need some way 
to do this collision avoidance. So this, um, uh, you know, kind of intuition is actually from the pedestrian um, uh, walking model. So, so if I walk in a crowded mall or crowded campus, you know, a lot of students or, or professors are walking, but they are not, you know, bumping to each other. So they have some kind of algorithm running in their head to lead them to their destination, at the same time avoid bumping to each other. So we want to develop uh, the similar behavior for each aircraft. Are these all the same altitudes? Yes, same altitudes, yeah. All right, so, so in this work, we, you know, we just uh, you know, are working on our first step. We want to only want to control this yellow guy. And we want, only want to control this yellow guy to lead him or her to, to, to his destination without crashing to uh, other uh, aircraft. And we don't care about red guys at this moment. Uh, we have you know, some ongoing work to handle all of them. But in this talk, let's assume we just focus on one single guy, this uh, yellow guy, and guide him uh, to his de uh, uh, final destination. So this is what we want to do. Um, right, so the research problem here is can we design a real-time computational guidance algorithm? So guidance, again, means to lead an aircraft fly from point A to point B. Uh, real-time computational means before departure, I do not calculate the entire trajectory. I just let this guy take off, just like, you know, after class, I walk out of this building to campus and to walk to the other building. I know my destination is the other building. But I roughly know how I walk there. But with all the, the other people walking, how do I kind of avoid uh, other people and, and walk to my destination? Uh, with collision avoidance capability to enable free flight operation in urban air mobility. So that's our research problem. So let's see some related work. Um, so because our research problem contains two parts, there is guidance part, there is collision avoidance part. Let's see this collision avoidance part, uh, what people have done, or what what's actually is working in, in real world. So number one, we have TCAS. Uh, this is traffic alert and collision avoidance system. Uh, this actually is aircraft to aircraft and handle one-on-one -on -one aircraft. And this is the last defense against mid-air collision. So, you know, we, we take uh, flights for travel and we feel safe, um, not only because the FAA side, we have traffic flow management, we have, you know, tactical air traffic controller monitoring each uh, airspace, but we also have this last barrier, uh, which called TCAS, to handle, you know, within you know, 30 or uh, 15 minutes before crash, this algorithm, th this device will give the alert to pilots and make sure the airplane do not crash. Again, this is 15 to 30 seconds before uh, mid-air collision, and uh, this TCAS only offer uh, vertical maneuvers because in sh such a short time, vertical maneuvers is the most efficient way to uh, avoid uh, colliding. Um, number, number two, we have ACAS-X. Uh, this, you know, in, in, in aviation side, people usually think ACAS-X is the next generation of TCAS. So this uses the same cockpit uh, or flight deck display. You know, the, the, the pilots will see the same thing, see the same display, hear the same alert, uh, they use same hardware, they use same antenna, uh, same transponder, uh, but difference, different advisory logic. So in ACAS, we have this fixed rules. Uh, basically, it's a table. So depending how two aircraft will encounter, it actually have a table to look up. Uh, versus uh, ACAS-X have a probabilistic model. Uh, actually, ACAS-X is about solving a Markov decision process with discrete uh, state space. Uh, so remember, here is a discrete state space. So those two are air-to-air, one-on-one. -air, uh, -on -one. 
And then we ha also have some ground-based um, algorithm or software to help. So though this is already in use in everyday operations. This is planned to be used. This has already been through flight test and FAA already proved certified. This is planned to use. Uh, this hasn't been, you know, this has been, you know, tested in simulation environment. Uh, this, uh, this two are both developed by NASA researchers, but haven't been uh, implemented in uh, real world. So this is a ground-based, it's centralized algorithm. Uh, this is about uh, to resolve conflict, so or prevent loss of separation. So again, conflict means uh, a far away um, kind of danger uh, versus crash. So we have mid-air collision. We call it crash. We call it near. We, we have second level of um, in danger uh, situation. We call it near mid-air collision, and then we have conflict. So this. Major goal is uh, is aiming to solve uh, resolve the conflict. So the planning horizon is about 35 seconds to eight minutes. There's threshold parameter you can change, but you know from 35 seconds to eight minutes before crash and the system will be uh, triggered. So in 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 this work in uh, our work, uh, so here the system is one-on-one. -on -one. So in our work, we will uh, try to do one-on-many, because in the video we showed we have one yellow aircraft, but we have many red aircraft. So our scope is one-on-many. So their planning horizon is 15 to 35 seconds, but we work on more far away um, uh, horizon. And lastly, here they solve IMDP with discrete state space. Uh, in our work, we want to solve an MDP with continuous uh, state space. So those are the difference here. All right, so number two related work, we want to focus on the guidance side or the trajectory optimization side. Uh, so you know, people will ask, oh, you want to do this, why you don't plan all the you know, multi-aircraft trajectories by a centralized algorithm? So in that case, you know, like this way. Um, initially, it has uh, trajectories all, uh, you know, uh, crashing into each other, but through a centralized optimal control framework, it can actually uh, generate those collision-free trajectories. So how, you know, why don't we do that? Uh, so let's walk through centralized uh, motion planning or trajectory planning um, uh, uh, literature. So. In robotic motion planning, the earliest research is on uh, computational geometry. Uh, this is from Professor Latome uh, at Stanford. So he, he does a lot of uh, robot motion planning work. And then uh, John Kenny, so in his um, master thesis at MIT, he proved uh, in general uh, motion planning uh, can be changed to a piano mover problem. And he, he showed that that problem is actually uh, NP-hard. So it's, which means it's very difficult to solve, um, you know, in real time. So then, because this problem is really difficult to solve, and then people start to uh, uh, proposing uh, sample-based uh, motion planning methods. So we have uh, PRM proposed by uh, Professor Kavraki and Professor Latome. Uh, we have the most famous one is RRT. Uh, by Professor uh, Lavelle and Kufner. Uh, so, by the way, when when Lavelle uh, wrote the RT paper, he was still in Iowa State teaching. Uh, so, and then we have advanced version or variant uh, version of um, RT uh, is RRG and RRT star. Uh, you know, by uh, Karaman and Frazzoli from MIT. So, those are the motion planning type of um, literature. Uh, in optimal control or in uh, air, um, airspace world, so, so Eric Frome, Jonathan Hall, uh, Damore, and Frazzoli, those people kind of freeze this centralized multi-agent conflict-free trajectory planning into an optimal control framework. Uh, but some 
formulation is in a convex optimization, which is semi-definite programming or mixed integer linear programming, or they solve them in a sequential convex optimization. Uh, but we can see here those um, you know, optimization uh, models are usually um, uh, difficult to solve, or at least takes time to solve. So, but, uh, so some people then use a genetic algorithm or particle swarm to try to solve the optimization problem as well. Um, but our goal is to come up with you know, a faster type of solution and which will uh, be implemented in an online manner. Okay, uh, related work three. Uh, so here we still talk about trajectory optimization, but you know, compared with before, uh, here we do a centralized, so all those are centralized um, path planning or trajectory optimization. So can we do distributed uh, trajectory uh, optimization? So the, the reason people want to do distributed trajectory optimization is there are two advantages. Uh, number one uh, is uh, it is able to scale. Uh, it's faster because the computations on each agent. And then it is kind of robust because one agent fail, you know, we still have, you know, the other guys can still um, calculate their optimal solution. Um, the other translation could be for robust is uh, if we have centralized trajectory optimization. We have all 10 aircraft trajectory carefully planned. You know, everyone should execute their own trajectory. But suddenly the 11th guy show up or a bird show up. So the entire planning will be um, ruined. So the whole calculation must be restart. Uh, but here, because this is a dis uh, distributed and also reactive type of uh, approach, so it's more robust. So some earlier attempts here are if we want to do co a cooperative um, control, usually there will be a negotiation mechanism through uh, message passing uh, or um, Claire Tumbling, they have attempt to do decentralized optimization, uh, but still with some of um, kind of uh, mechanism or rule-based uh, setting. And then uh, Jonathan Hall have this decentralized MPC. Um, and then this part is also Jonathan Hall uh, deep reinforcement learning. Uh, they actually claim they can solve uh, multi-agent, but in their paper, they only described uh, two, two agents or two cars. Um, so lastly, we have this ORCA. Uh, this is a geometry-based algorithm, and this is actually the fastest algorithm uh, have been selected as a benchmark for multiple uh, previous work. So we'll select ORCA as our uh, benchmark to compare as well. So a rough idea of ORCA is, so suppose this is our yellow aircraft we want to control. Suppose we have a, minima, uh, a minimum um, um, aircraft speed, and then we have a maximum uh, velocity here, or actually speed. And then we also have a, you know, a limitation on the turning angle, uh, because of, as an aircraft, you cannot fly too aggressively. So we also have a limitation on the turning angle. So the feasible um, uh, velocity vector will land in one of these feasible regions. So, so the so, so feasible uh, velocity vector will be uh, one point inside this gray area. So this is without any intruders or surrounding aircraft. With other vehicles approaching him, this feasible region will be cut into a smaller region. So the final, his final feasible region might be a, a pretty small region uh, to select uh, one speed from that. So that's their rough idea on ORCA. Okay. So our solution methods, uh, so our plan, so after this literature uh, review, so our plan is to formulate this problem as a Markov decision process, uh, but rather continuous 
uh, state Markov decision process and then solve it using Monte Carlo Tracers, MCTS. So a little bit about Markov decision process or MDP. It is a sequential decision making uh, tool uh, you know, dec for decision, sequential decision making under uncertainty. Uh, the idea here is to maximize the cumulative uh, reward by choosing optimal actions uh, in the way. So, so, some, so actually MDP is studied by different groups of um, people. So optimal control people call Markov decision process as discrete um, stochastic optimal control. And OR people call this uh, stochastic dynamic programming. But uh, in, I guess in, uh, in CS, uh, people call this Markov decision process. And this, our solution part is Monte Carlo tree search. Uh, so Monte Carlo tree search is, a, so to, to solve this MDP, there are multiple uh, ways to solve it. So one category could be you know, just solve it as a dynamic programming because we know dynamic programming is a classical way to solve a discrete, discretized optimal control problem. And dynamic programming can solve that. Now, a second category is we use approximate dynamic programming. So, so if we cannot solve this problem exactly, uh, we can solve it in an approximate way uh, with some proven bound. Uh, the third category is the online methods. So this Monte Carlo tree search is one of the online methods. So if you guys pay attention to the recent development of the AI, so last year or maybe two years ago, um, uh, this company called DeepMind, uh, they built an agent called AlphaGo, beat the, the human champion in the game of Go. So their algorithm is actually uh, uh, Monte Carlo tree search. Uh, they formulate the problem as an MDP as well. But of course, they have other you know, techniques blended in, but the core of their algorithm is Monte Carlo tree search here. Okay, the idea of Monte Carlo tree search is you know, going through these four, uh, four steps. Uh, number one, you know, we have a selection inside this tree, and then we have this expansion to expand this tree. And if we meet a point or meet a state or meet a situation we never see before, we use the default policy to do this rollout or simulation to estimate how good this action should be. And then we back propagate the value of this action to the decision point, because the root of the tree is the decision point. All the other nodes are your future sequential decisions. All right, so the idea here is we estimate the value of an action at a state by simulations, and we build a search tree according to the simulations. Each node of this search tree is my current, or sorry, my next action or my future actions, with the label on each node representing, go ahead. So how expensive each simulation run? Good. Uh, good point. In this application, it's 50 uh, milliseconds. And, and they're all um, stochastic simulations. Stochastic simulations, yes. So you have to run multiple runs in order to... Uh, correct. So, so here we will show we run 100 simulations. Um, the total is 50... Uh, let's see, let's see. No, for each decision. decision. For each decision, we run this a uh, hundred times, and then we make a, we pick a action. And what is exactly that you're simulating the the paths? I mean, like how they going to travel? Or uh, yeah, it's actually the actions. Yeah. We'll we'll show that later. Yeah. Good question. Oh. All right. So here we have some problem assumptions to make our life easier. Number one, all the aircraft fly at the same altitude. Again, we talk about this is. Uh, en route operation, we don't handle uh, departure and landing. Uh, number two, all the intruders or other aircraft fly straight at constant speed. Uh, this is kind of sounds pretty lame, but in real world, this can be justified uh, because 
uh, you know, in real world, other aircraft flight intention, um, they can more or less be estimated. So literature show their flight intention can be either estimated or actually directly given by their flight plan. Uh, number three, the own ship or the yellow, yellow aircraft we are trying to control has a perfect sensor without measurement error, which means um, exactly we can detect other guys' uh, position. Uh, but in the current version, I'm going to show you this assumption is gone uh, because we do have the measurement error in the intruders. We also have the noises or stochasticity in the own ship's movement. Okay, so we'll talk about two parts. Uh, number one part is how do we formulate the problem? Number two is how do we solve the problem? So how do we formulate the problem? As we mentioned, by, through this, by using this MDP process. So in MDP, we have um, you know, several uh, key uh, points uh, we want to model or to define. Number one, the state. So in this problem, we define the state as the position and the velocity of all aircraft, heading angle of own ship, and also the position of the goal. So action will sh will show you know what's a typical state uh, later on. So action here, in this demonstration, because later on I'll show you some uh, tree exploring type of thing. In this demonstration, we only have three actions: we turn left, turn right by a certain degree, uh, we go straight. Uh, but in the current implemented version, we have uh, uh, nine actions. Uh, not only we have the option of turning angle, but we also have the option of uh, the speed, speed change. Uh, but the, the limitation here is the action space here is actually uh, discrete uh, versus state space is continuous. Uh, number three, uh, we define terminal states, uh, which means if the entire simulation, the yellow aircraft, meet one of the three states, uh, the entire simulation will stop. Number one, we have a conflict state. So the aircraft will uh, you know, find itself being conflicted with other aircraft, the simulation will stop. Um, number two, we have a boundary state, which means the yellow aircraft um, crash to the boundary of the map, uh, we make the simulation stop. And number three, the yellow aircraft uh, arrive at the goal state uh, and the simulation or episode will stop. Uh, reward here, one if the own ship arrive at the goal state and zero otherwise. So only the own ship goes to the goal state will get rewarded. In the other case, like crash into the boundary, crash to other aircraft will not get reward. Okay, so here's the example of a state in MDP. So here we have uh, one own ship, one intruder, and one um, uh, goal position. For the above figure, the state will be, so here we have position and velocity for the intruder, which are both in red color. We have position, velocity, we also have heading for the own ship. And then we have only the position in green color with the destination or the goal position. Okay, so how, you know, in, in MDP, we also need to define a state transition between each state. So how do we define state transition here? So first of all, let's see the intruder's state. So intruder information will be updated through our assumption Either we assume they are flying constant speed at straight line, or we have some estimation on their speed and, um, and position. And number two, the goal uh, position or goal information will stay the same, uh, will not change. Uh, number three, the own ship information will be updated using own ship kinematics. Uh, we do build some uh, light uh, dynamics for the own ship uh, in, uh, in, in terms of do not let the yellow aircraft make crazy maneuvers. We do have some limitations. So here is, uh, 
here is a simple kinematic model, but, but in the most recent uh, work, we, we have the banking angle instead. Here is the very simple kinematic model. Uh, the kinematic model of the ownership will be uh, this. And then we use, oh, okay, so this is the heading angle. This is uh, speed. And we will use the discretized version of the above model to update the ownership uh, information. So here is the equations we use to update in our simulator, to update the ownership um, position. Oh. Okay, here is our model. And next, we will talk about how do we solve this. So our solution is Monte Carlo tree search algorithm. So at the current decision-making moment, suppose I'm at ST and my simulation is zero, and I want to determine which action I should take. In this simple example, I only have three actions. I go straight, I go left, I go right. So first simulation, simulation one, I go left, and I find myself, uh, you know, crashed to another aircraft or, you know, crashing to the boundary. So the reward here is zero, and because it's a terminal state, so the episode will stop, and I run my second simulation, go straight, nothing happened, and I and I, I go in depth in this tree, I go straight again. This is you know, also random. I go straight again, nothing happened. And then what we do? So we, you know, we cannot afford to let this tree to run infinite depths. So what do we do? We actually add a heuristic here. So if nothing happened in second depth or third, third depth or third layer, so what do we do? We have a heuristic to guess how good this state is. If nothing happened, we kind of estimate how far away I am from the goal. So 0.7 means I'm pretty you know, close to the goal. So this equation basically means the closer to the goal, I get 1.0. The, the farther from the goal, I get 0. So here is a heuristic. I estimate uh, the value of this state. And then I run my third simulation. This time I go right, and then I go left again. I do an estimation or heuristic again. I get this value, and I back propagate this value here. And next simulation I go here, here is one, and I back propagate this value here. And this is the same. Uh, when we first go straight and then go left, uh, we crashed and then we uh, kind of backpropagate this to, to this node. And then and continue we do this, uh, and then we run multiple simulations, and then we decide you know, the value of taking each action. And then we pick the action with the largest um, value. Suppose in this case we only run seven simulations, and then the largest value is taking the action of going right, so in this example. Is there a transition, you, you calculate a transition probability? I mean, transition to probability. go from one node to another? Uh, to go from one node to the other, yes, so. Or, or like you have a two node right. from ST1, you plug from, is it the same probability that you go from that node to the lower position node? From here yeah, to, to down. To down. Is there all the same probability of occurrence? Uh, I see. I see your point. So our our state transition is governed by this actually. So suppose I take left, and then I simulate my movement of the aircraft. Of course, my movement of aircraft have some noises, have some probability. And then at the same time, I have other intruders information. So, so, not, so this node transition not only is not governed by the transition probability, it's rather governed by what really happened in the environment. If I take right, if I take left, and what will happen? So, so the strength of the value that you calculate is somehow 
your transition probability? Uh, because you calculate some kind of a value. Right. A point seven. Uh, right. Point nine becomes a point five. So that's like almost a, a transition probability. Is that what it is? Oh no, that's a value. So point nine and point five is a value, not a transition probability. So so you have point five and right. point nine, for example. Right. Okay? Right. So uh, when you go to point nine. Uh, right. So right. It's almost like a, uh, the higher the value, the probability of going to that node is higher. Oh, I see. So the higher the value, will we will deterministically pick that action, yeah. right? Okay. So here is our numerical experiment set up. Uh, so episodes per experiment is one thousand. Episode. Okay, we'll show that later. Aerospace area is uh, twenty-four kilometers by twenty-four kilometers. On ship initial speed is 60 meter per second. We'll put the yellow aircraft at the bottom right corner every time. So put it here. Give it an initial speed. So, so the remaining results I'm showing is the new result. So we, we have the action with not only by turning, but also by changing speed. So here is the initial speed. And then the on ship. Initial heading is this angle. So basically, if, if this is a square, so my own ship is pointing directly to the center of the map. And then we have how do we define a conflict? A conflict is defined if two aircraft are within 500 meters. How do we define near mid air collision? It's defined if the two aircraft are within 150 meters. How do we define actual? Mid air collision without the end is defined by two aircraft are physically uh, overlapped or cl collide. But we, we didn't define it here. We just want to track conflict and near, uh, near mid air, co air collision, these two metrics in this research. Uh, number of intruders, we have 80. Plus on ship, we have 81 aircraft in this um, region. So here is, uh, we show how do we tune our Monte Carlo tree search algorithm. So in this algorithm, we have two major parameters to tune. Uh, number one is the depths we want to search. Again, we don't want to go very deep. Uh, so here we try search depths two, three, four. And in all four category uh, metrics here, uh, you know, we observe search depths Three is good enough. Uh, number two we want to tune is the number of simulations. So as, as you just mentioned, you know, how many, you know, if I want to make a decision, I need to run some simulations. So how many simulations I, I want to run? So in this case, uh, we showed some results and eventually we picked uh, 100, uh, 100 simulation, which is actually here. Um, and then uh, the four categories uh, performance uh, index we are tracking is number one, uh, you know, what's the probability of every episode my yellow aircraft can arrive to my goal, which is a green star. So if, you know, in this case, we have search depth of two, uh, which is, uh, you know, approximately 92% probability. To, to arrive at the green star. But if we turn the search depth to three and four, the probability will be, uh, you know, I would say uh, over or at least equal to 98%. So we think search depth three is good enough. And then the two collision metrics we are tracking is NMAC probability and then average um, um, conflicts here. So here we observe again, you know, search steps three and four will give us about 1%, so 0.01, 1% probability for NMAC. So remember, NMAC is not actual collision. It's just within 150 meters. And here, the average conflict we observe is below 0.2. Um, so, 
So last metric we want to track in is the average running time. So we can observe here, if we set the search depth equal to two, it's pretty fast. But if we set search depth three and four, the running time is higher. And you know, it's also increasing with the number of simulations. So eventually we pick search depth three and running time is uh, 100. Um, oh, uh, 100 microseconds. So the results here, again, we are showing the performance metrics for all four categories. Uh, number one, we have, uh, we also benchmarking our algorithm with this ORCA. We talked about this. Uh, their idea is to formulate the feasible region for their vector uh, speed, uh, you know, velocity vector, and pick a point inside this feasible region, so ORCA. And then we also want to try what if we do not simulate 100 times? What if we just simulate 10 times? You know, is that, is that you know, we call this uh, MCTS uh, fast. So how good the performance is. So, we are, so first we are comparing the goal probability. So we can see that with the number of intruder aircraft increase all the way to 80 other aircraft, our algorithm MCTS uh, performs you know, the best among those three. And number two and number three actually behave similar. So for NMAC, our algorithm, this yellow line, uh, provided the lowest NMAC probability. And ORCA, you know, initially performs pretty well, uh, but then it cannot handle uh, too many uh, intruder aircraft. Here shows the same, uh, the si similar trend. Uh, so our uh, MCTS uh, that provided the lowest average uh, conflicts, while the other two algorithm uh, performs uh, worse when there were more uh, intruders. Uh, but our algorithm is uh, pretty expensive. Uh, so if we are talking about 80 uh, intruder aircraft, uh, we are talking about up to 80 uh, microseconds um, running time per decision because of all those uh, simulations. Okay, limitation here. Uh, so in this work, we only talk about how do we control one aircraft, so one yellow aircraft. So the MCTS cannot directly handle multiple aircraft problems. So we need some other um, technique to handle multiple aircraft problem, which we will show a demo later. Um, another limitation is the action space is discrete, uh, which means we only allow the aircraft to turn left at a certain angle, turn right at a certain angle, and also with speed change at certain um, value. So the action space is discrete uh, versus ORCA, we can see their region is a continuous um, uh, feasible region. So our trajectory is kind of zigzag type of uh, trajectory versus ORCA. So this is the extreme case where no intruders in this space, no red aircraft, just myself and my goal. So in this case, the ORCA can go directly to the goal, uh, but the MCTS uh, needs to take this uh, wiggly trajectory. So that's another uh, major limitation here. So additional considerations, uh, number one, uh, we want to have better kinematic model uh, because in uh, aircraft we do not we can we usually cannot control the heading directly. We actually control the aircraft banking. Banking is like uh, this type of angle. So so we already have that in the new. Uh, the results are actually from the new uh, kinematic model. And then we didn't uh, factor in three dimension. Maneuvers. We only handle horizontal uh, maneuvers. That's uh, that's another thing uh, we want to try. And then stress testing. So uh, how good our algorithm is uh, with uh, with large uh, with large number of um, uh, intruders. We still need have a lot of work to do in simulation. 
and then sensor error and uncertainty. So we already have that. Uh, so in our, in the plots I just show, uh, we already factor in the ownership movement noise or the ownership uncertain the, the uncertainty in, in ownership dynamics. So for example, there is what if there is wind or what if there is other type of uncertainty uh, when when you want to turn left, uh, but the trajectory might not be exactly behave like that. We also have the intruder uncertainty as well. So intruder not on, will not only move constant speed as straight line, uh, rather it has you know. Uh, varied speed and uh, um, um, and trajectory. So, but uncertainty is not our major concern because um, Monte Carlo tree search is built to handle uncertainty. Or I can just so solve this problem with the A star tree search. So that that can do it well. But so so we we do not have a lot of concern on uncertainty. Um, and then the other idea is you know. You know, this um, Monte Carlo tree search algorithm seems to uh, behave well, at least in this control one aircraft, yellow aircraft case. So can we use this system as an expert and then use the expert knowledge to train a neural network? At the same time, you know, can we prove this neural network have some uh, bounds or, or verify this neural network? Uh, that's another idea we, uh, we are trying. And then how do we handle multiple aircraft? So I would say this part is done. This part is almost done. This part is done. This part is done. Uh, I'll show you a demo. So this is a multiple aircraft demo. So how good it is. So we have multiple aircraft. Each of them will go to their own goal. There are some goal position here, but you may not. Uh, see it very well, but you know, basically, what if we let this algorithm run on multiple aircraft with some coordination mechanism? You know, if this algorithm will will run well. So, so so far so good. You know, we can we try a ten aircraft, twenty aircraft. You know, it's good. But when we try eighty aircraft, it just takes very long to to run um, uh, because you know the simulation. Uh, will cost um, a lot of time. Okay, and then flight testing. So our flight testing idea is to to do the flight testing in the autonomous drone racing platform. This is uh, a platform we constructed in our lab. So we want to use this aircraft to do some indoor drone racing. So we have some gates, we have some obstacles, and let the drone to race with a human controlled drone autonomously. Uh, the you know, the reason they need this collision avoidance because if we are not competing with a human, if I just fly by myself, I can use optimal control to plan my entire trajectory and let this guy to follow my pre-calculated trajectory. But because we have other drones flying at the same time, so it needs to have some collision avoidance uh, here. Uh, okay, so so we talk about this urban air mobility, and we talk about urban air mobility operations. Uh, we talk about the autonomy side of urban air mobility, and we pick one small topics for today to go through. But to achieve, you know, the entire autonomous urban air mobility operation takes a lot of expertise and effort. So this effort was our uh, one of our earlier proposal to NASA. Uh, trying to uh, tackle this uh, this problem. All right, so 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 not only urban air mobility, but also in um, you know, UAS traffic management, uh, it also needs this type of collision avoidance capability. Uh, so I've been very heavily involved in uh, this uh, UTM or UAS traffic management community. So it, this is you know two years ago or almost three years ago. Uh, this is a panel on uh, UTM. Uh, we have uh, myself, uh, Professor uh, John Hansman from MIT. Uh, we have a guy from uh, Verizon Venture. We have Sean Cassidy from Amazon. They want to use uh, UAV to deliver Amazon package. Uh, and we have PK 
uh, from NASA, uh, who was con who is considered as the founder of this uh, UTM concept. Okay, summary. So in this uh, today's talk, we proposed a computational guidance algorithm with collision avoidance capability. Uh, we formulated this problem as an MDP problem. Uh, MDP and also solved it use uh, uh, Monte Carlo tree search algorithm. Uh, the simulation results uh, are promising. Uh, it can, it show can achieve zero NMAC performance under a certain air traffic density. Uh, so to be specific, uh, I want to say under 60 uh, intruders within that small region, our, air, uh, uh, our algorithm can achieve zero NMAC performance. Uh, so, from the other perspective, our simulation can provide um, a benchmark to the policy maker how, you know, what type of air traffic density is safe. So, do you want to fit 60 aircraft inside this region, 80, 100, or 50, you know, to up to what limit is the safe air traffic density. So, other considerations and uh, future work are needed to allow this algorithm to uh, making safe autonomous free flight a reality in urban air mobility. Okay, that's all I have for today. Um, any questions and comments? Okay. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, right, right, right. So, so in urban air mobility, this is kind of newer concept. Let's talk about the new but older one, which is use a smaller drone to fly over people in the cities. This is uh, UAS traffic management or UTM. So, the insurance industry are very interested uh, in in this. Uh, you know, use a small drone in the urban setting. Uh, but the discussion is still ongoing. Uh, but so so insurance company are were hesitant or kind of they didn't know how to work with this type of operation. But in Iowa, it's it's strange. So Iowa in Des Moines, we happen to have several insurance companies. Uh, they initially are in a discussion with them, uh, but the current state they are actually utilize some of the drones to do their business. Uh, for example. Some insurance companies want to evaluate uh, you know, how much they should put on a farmer's silo. The silo is a very tall thing, which is filled with a lot of agriculture product. So usually, insurance people will climb a big chair and go to the top and inspect, you know, is there a, cr a corrosion on the roof of the silo? Is there a corrosion on their barn or on their, on their wind farm? We have a lot of wind, wind farm, wind turbine in Iowa. But now insurance companies start to use the drones to actually do the, the inspection of those uh, projects. What I'm talking about is the fact that if the insurance company decides right. that this idea right. is not viable because they can't insure it, you right. can't get off the ground. Right. In which certification is one thing, right. but practical consideration. So if they decide that they're not going to insure this. Right, right. Then they're never going to get off the ground. Right, right, right. So part, in other words, they can use it. They use anything they want in the right. world. But in terms of, you know, they have to be part of the initial mm. discussion. Discussion. Right, right, right. And, and, you know, so do they, what's the connection between the two? In other words, you have to convince them right. that this is viable. Right. They're going to take a chance. Right. On this. Right. And if they decide that it's not, then it's not going to happen. Agree, agree. I think that will very much happen on the manufacturer side. So if Airbus or other or Bell or Embraer, all those companies can build an aircraft through and also 
you know, go through a series of flight tests and show, show the insurance company, you know, give them confidence, you know, this thing is safe. Maybe they are willing to do that, but it, if not the case, I, you know, I think it won't, it won't fly. Yeah, I agree, I agree, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but I think there's heavy uh, investments in the vehicle designer and manufacturing side at current stage because I think uh, you know a lot of uh, technology VC in Bay Area. I mean, they have have a lot of money to invest, and and this sector is one of their uh, you know most interested sector in, in at least in the past year. So so we observe a lot of companies, at least over fifty companies all over the world are building this type of vehicles. What about the other alternate uh, like power sources like solar or microwave? Depends like the upcoming, you know, if you can eliminate the, the need for uh, batteries. Right, right. Right, so, yeah, so people already kind of gave up a little bit on, you know, the battery side because they know the current battery technology is not there. So they are talking about hybrid power. So maybe gas and and batteries, um, but yeah, that's 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 a possibility. Yes, Joe. Uh, so I've seen uh, like uh, in New York they have um, uh, like the Tesla Model Three and Model Three Plus, and then they have the electrics. that something like uh, how feasible is this to implement this, or is it going to have to? Uh, I think for airport access. Right, good point. I, th I think you are talking about the connection of this transportation mode to the conventional transportation mode in, in terms of uh, airports, in terms of, you know, sort of subway stations. Uh, I think uh, if they have regulations and policies for helicopters to access the, the airport, th this type of vehicles will follow a similar uh, protocol. Yeah, because right now, Right, so here we are talking about larger guys. Yeah. So, uh, so right now the FAA's policy is only on the smaller drone, which is under 50 pounds. This is definitely the heavier guys, yeah. Yes? Can you put one piece of the main road to extend the city to help um, right. up into city too? Um, how, how do you see that affecting the performance of the additional level of the transportation space for either going or down. Right. Yeah, so so additional level of the more actions and also the kinematic model will factor in 3D. But our idea is not to touch on 3D too soon because you know in in in, in higher altitude we are flying. Uh, you know, when we take air travel, our airspace is actually nicely uh, splitted into different levels. So each aircraft just stay on their own uh, altitude. But here I, I would imagine the only case we want to utilize 3D is, again, in the TCAS situation, the two aircraft are almost going to collide within 15 minutes, 15 seconds or 35 seconds, and then it can utilize the vertical space. Otherwise, I prefer you know all the aircraft stay in their designated um, Altitude that'll be safer, I think. Yeah. Yes. I guess what could be my uh, solution is that without any road collision. So, is, is there a way to compare them their performance and how optimal your uh, algorithm is to what degree? Yeah, that's very very good question. So, here we only showed our algorithm is safe. You know, without getting a Mac or a collision and can arrive at destination, but we never show anything about optimal. So like, if we want to take the avoidance and take another avoidance, and you know, in the initial video we show a yellow aircraft goes all the way and then go, go, go to the final destination, you know, how much extra time we are expending in the air, you know, we have no control in that. So that, that, 
can be dangerous because you know those aircraft are electric powered. You cannot let, let this guy stay in the air for too long. So they're using some kind of random control and it is easy to get uh, right, so in, in optimal control, we mentioned they have, in optimal control, basically our goal is to minimize time or minimize energy. Uh, but we also mentioned in traditional optimal control, they need a lot of computation time. Uh, so, so optimal control in this case, I don't think it can provide a, a, a solid real-time solution. So there's we cannot directly compare with them because they cannot provide a, a real-time solution. Right. So I actually have a question yeah. to, to, the, to the previous one. How, uh, is there a guarantee that uh, following this, uh, your algorithm, the aircraft will eventually get the destination? Is it possible that it will keep avoiding the other aircraft without uh, arriving at the destination ever? So far, we can we do not provide a guarantee. Yeah. Uh, but another challenge is we limited aircraft can only fly in this uh, square right. uh, map. Right. If we don't have boundaries, we allow aircraft can go out. I would say eventually maybe it will get to a destination, but okay. intuitively, but no guarantee, no, right. yeah. More questions? Okay, then. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you calculated the exercise of the constraint in your algorithm for the No, we haven't. Haven't. That's, that's a very good question. That's kind of related to, yeah, so can we limit it? Can, can we limit what's the maximum time in the air right. this guy should stay? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's ask the. Sure. Thank you very much. And if we have more questions, we will be around until some 5 p.m. And uh, feel free to, uh, to come to my office and, uh, and discuss with me. Thank you. Thank you.